Hi, everyone again. Uh, um, my name is Ricardo Garcia. I'm the CEO, CEO and co-founder of Oncohiros Bioscience, also Rich is that, uh, a brain tumor survivor. Um, I'm here to introduce the next um, guest of our next session. Um, we're going to talk about child cancer academic research. We have uh, Nita Radha Krishan, pediatric oncologist. Um, Dr. Nita is an associate professor and head uh, department of pediatric hematology oncology at the Postgraduate Institute of Child Health, Noida, India. She is a co-chair at the International Society for Pediatric Oncology, (CIOP) partnership uh, working group. Um, she is also an executive council member of the Indian Society of Primary Immunodeficiencies, Nodal Officer of Hemophilia Telesemia Services in Nagar, and Section Editor of Pediatric Hematology Oncology Journal. Welcome, Nita. Uh, thank you for joining today. Thank you. We also have um, Professor um, Geoffrey Chan which is the chair of the Chan Sun Xiong Family Foundation. Professor Chan is currently the head of the Department of Pediatrics and Adolescence Medicine at HQU Shenzhen Hospital. He has held the Xiao Yan Shou and Noel Professorship of Pediatrics at the University of Hong Kong. So thank you so much, Professor Geoffrey, for joining the session today. Um, I think we should have another speaker coming on board. I'm not sure if I can see Dinesh. Anyway, so um, I think we have another speaker that was coming today and joining us, Dinesh uh, Pinhard Carr. I don't see him on the call. All right, so let's go. Um, I'd like to speak first, um, maybe the first question for both of you, and then maybe um, you can take any of you can take the question first, can answer the question is, if you could share the beginning of your journey in the field of oncology of the child cancer research and what motivated you to uh, dedicate your professional career uh, to support pediatric cancer. So uh, may I start first? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, I'm uh, currently uh, working in the Hong Kong University. First of all, I mean, uh, thank you, uh, Ricardo, for the introduction. And uh, a while ago, I listened to the other two speaker. The first thing came to my mind, and uh, in fact, I noticed Professor Barbara actually is working in Hong Kong, but I never met her. <laughs> and I, I don't even know uh, she's working on uh, child cancer. So the first thing we have to do uh, is to uh, improve our communication within the pediatric oncology community. I think that's very important. So uh, a while ago, uh, 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 Professor Ricardo asked me, uh, how did I start uh, with this uh, pediatric uh, cancer research? I still remember uh, after my fellowship training, um, I returned, uh, at that time I went to St. Jude, and then I returned back to Hong Kong. And one of the diseases that struck me is neuroblastoma, and because uh, the survival was very bad, even at St. Jude at that time. So I got to know uh, there's a monoclonal antibody called the NDGD2, and that time was de developed by the Stone Ketten Group, uh, Professor Lai Kong Chang. Uh, so, um, and then I tried to get into this antibody that was in 1999. And uh, very luckily, uh, Professor Chang happened to be from Hong Kong as well. So we were able to work together, and then I was able to get that drug for our clinical trial. So I know how much actually the drug initially costs. So for the manufacturing, for each patient, probably you're talking about less than 10,000 US dollar per person, per patient. But now, by the time they're selling this drug, you are talking about 200,000 US per patient. So then I would like to say, what happened? maybe in the later the discussion, because we are talking about raising funding donation, but what made the drug so expensive? So I want to, uh, I mean, try to explore into that, okay? And from uh, my uh, limited experience with that. So um, that's how I start and I got into this uh, drug drug. But by the time I bought this drug back to Hong Kong, because this is an unregistered drug, so I have to pass through many process of regulatory uh, process. It took me another two years. 
And I also have to raise funding. And where did I get the funding? Actually, just like today, I got the funding for the newspaper, the mass media. And finally, I raised the funding enough for me to treat 30 patients. Uh, so that's how I start. So I can share this experience with uh, all of you later on. And one of the problems for pediatric oncology is a low volume, high risk kind of disease. So the clinical trial will be very, very expensive and take a long time. And then fortunately, all of us are sitting here, we are from Asia. Asia has 70% of the world population. But by the time we ask ourselves, how come all this drug trial seldom come to Asia? Why? So this is something uh, we have to think about. And many of the Asian country, when they come to this uh, new drug, import of this new drug, registration of this new drug, they look at the Western society as of whether they are registered or not. Why don't we Asian country, our expert, we are the expert, which is from our, I mean, advisory group to advise our government. So how to conduct trial in Asia, which, and then they should recognize us. And so that's exactly the incentive or initiative of uh, South Asia and also another organization, Professor Akira Lakakawara and me, uh, we found that uh, called the APOC, Asian Pediatric Hematology Oncology. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, uh, we have two Indian, uh, two Chinese, and then two Japanese, and a, a panel of many other Asian countries in the board. So I welcome all of you to join us. So we promote to run clinical trial for pediatric cancer in Asia to lower down the cost so the drug will be cheaper and faster to reach our patient. So, I mean, I will go into that in more yep. detail. Yep. And, uh, so Nita can talk about her experience first. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shan. Uh, Nita, I think you wanted to share some slides with the audience. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So All right. Shared. Here they are. Um, I don't think these are the slides. Yes, thank you. So I would like to thank uh, the entire team behind Oncoton and Jivag for conceptualizing this and taking this forward. I think we've never seen anything of this uh, magnitude ever. And I hope um, we re um, the mission reaches its target and thanks to the entire team behind it. And uh, so I've been uh, asked to share my experience in uh, working in a center which is catering to extremely um, difficult uh, scenarios, especially social uh, scenarios. So treating uh, cancer in midst of all this is what I'm going to um, be sharing with you. Uh, could you advance the slide, please? So these are the challenges that we face um, in childhood cancer management. So many a times uh, children are present very late to the health facility because uh, I, I'm pretty sure that in many most of the low and middle income countries we do not have pediatric cancer in, in as part of the medical curriculum so most of the primary health center is being manned by doctors who have a basic graduation who do not have uh, awareness that even cancer exists in children and even when they have uh, they do not know what to do many a times even the doctors are uh, uh, doctors counsel that there's no treatment possible and the kids go home even the lay public uh, uh, feels so so uh, for an example uh, just just to cite an example on 4th of february um we the the world's cancer day celebrated so so one of the very prominent media houses here called me up and asked me about childhood cancer outcomes and i told them and they asked me to share um, um, share a couple of survivors details so with the permission of the family we gave uh, uh, the numbers of a couple of survivors for that so that they could interact directly and uh, release a positive media um, report subsequently um, half an hour later the the journalist calls me back and saying, but madam, this we, the numbers you have shared is all blood cancer patients. And uh, my editor says blood cancer, there, there is no survival in blood cancer. So how can you uh, show num uh, how can you share details of uh, disease, uh, patients who have apparently been cured? There is no survival. So that is the kind of uh, misinformation that is there out in the community. And uh, I don't think the paper ran that news item also. So this is the 
hardcore uh, reality that we face and we have to kind of uh, work towards uh, changing every single uh, obstacle in the path to get to uh, cure even when somebody really refers a patient there is poor access to healthcare there's poor referral pathways unlike in the us or the uk where there is a, and in australia many developed economies have a very good uh, referral pathway so that the patient wherever the patient is reaching that system automatically refers the child to a higher center here there is not there is no system like that so if the patient wants to go they will go if they want to, they want to go they have a choice of going to whichever center they want to go so because of all this there are a lot of um, issues created in um, a lot of money is wasted often by the time they reach a center which is capable to diagnose and treat there is um, and on top of all this there is gender bias there is um, poverty and uh, many a times the family things uh, and this is again a very stark reality that when they travel say 100 or 200 kilometers away to come and treat in a center uh, the family the the often the breadwinner will say of the family will say okay how do i stay here and treat for six months because if i don't work every single day who will feed the rest of my family so this is a very big uh, reality that we face so even if we provide free access to treatment and even food for the child food for the caretaker even then the entire other family the rest of the family a joint family might be dependent on the primary caregiver and so that becomes a big issue in uh, continuing care for these children then many many times centers even medical colleges do not have uh, facilities for diagnosis or treatment so they get referred and the one that i've highlighted in red is uh, preventable deaths so toxicity of treatment especially drug resistant organisms uh, uh, sepsis due to mdr organisms is a big reality again and this um, i think has increased over the years 10 years back treating cancer was easier on the same protocol treating cancer now is more difficult because there are so many organisms out there and most of them are drug resistant and that actually uh, is probably the biggest uh, um, hindrance currently once a child reaches the center now to get them through the treatment without losing the child to toxicity is becoming increasingly difficult and finally late effects and abandonment and abandonment 10 to 12 percentage of children still abandon treatment in this part of the world because they do not have uh, they feel that there is um, cancer is not something that is treatable when they uh, lose hair or when they start looking different the minute you talk to them about uh, say a nucleation in retinoblastoma or amputation in an osteosarcoma they just run away they will rather not treat the disease and lose the child than lose a limb so that's again one big issue that we face again i'm sure brain tumors will be similar uh, uh, they they don't even reach a healthcare facility the minute you near, hear the word brain tumor they just go home and let the uh, they are ready to lose the child rather than get to a curative treatment so these are the issues that we uh, see and many a times there are these magical remedies being offered by um, quacks who are out there again because of absence of a regulated system in that again no referral pathway as such we lose uh, few patients every year to such magical remedies also next slide please so in this context um, um, so this is a um, few pictures of um, um, infections that we see fungal infections as well as drug resistant bacterial infections extremely common out there uh, next slide please so um, this is probably what is actually accounting to that inequitability of care that we have been talking about and that is probably why even though this region the lmic see more than 80 percentage of cancer outcomes are poor i'm sure because of all these reasons next slide so we actually do not have a denominator as of now there are cancer registries being run by the country's uh, premier research organization which is indian council for medical research so that there are two ways of reporting childhood cancer one is through population based cancer registries and second is through hospital based cancer registries so both of them are not specific for childhood cancer it reports childhood cancer along with all the other cancers but again they are not wholesome because the huge population that we are catering to it's impossible to have a 100 percent reporting and it's these are just sample reporting that we have and these are the numbers that we have to go by next slide please and these are 
like the prevalence according to the population based cancer registry reporting next slide and these are the differences in numbers that we see so when we have per 1000 population if you um, calculate per million population if you calculate the numbers of patients diagnosed so there should not be any difference in terms of the region right so these are diseases which should not have that kind of a difference but if you look at india there is a huge difference in the gap of in uh, diagnosis especially for cns malignancies next slide and again by gender bias in healthcare seeking very very important so we face that very regularly the minute you tell them for any advanced treatment for example bone marrow transplant or they are not even willing to bring the sibling for a hla typing um, just because um, at times if it's a girl child they just abandon treatment and go back home next slide so these are the barriers i um, presented and uh, what are the solutions that have emerged uh, in the last few years that we have been trying to implement here is that for this late presentation a uh, one main aspect is to start educating at every level everybody in the team has to speak the same language so even inside the hospital from every cadre of healthcare has been taught how to speak to the patient the community there are um, public health workers called asha workers who have been regularly involved in training of them so that they pick up children in the community and refer on time in addition the government of india has something called a universal health care which is at present catering to probably around um, 20% of these children but it's slowly improving and that somehow i think with all the digital machine that is in place will improve universal health um, reporting as well universal something akin to a referral system that i talked about it's not yet there but i think it will improve strengthening of existing facilities have to be done an abandonment we have been trying to work hard for, by counseling of families as well as presenting survivor stories so even today there is a program um, on the occasion of international childhood cancer day where we are highlighting survivors so that the message goes out into the community that um, these are the children who have come out of treatment despite all hardships and this um, if they can do it even you can and of course treatment uh, toxicity being handled by nursing care improvement and training and education of doctors i think i'll stop here i'm yep. happy to take any questions and discuss this further thank you well thank you so much uh, for sharing this information i think that was really really interesting um i have to confess i have to admit that i learned something today i was going to ask you especially about what could be done when I heard all the things that you shared at the very beginning was just, you know, just biting my, like, my tongue because I wanted to ask you the questions about, okay, what, what could be done and that you already shared some of the potential solutions. Um, I wanna give some time to Dr. Uh, Chan. Um, uh, I'm not sure about why you wanna talk because, but I do have a question for you is about the work you're doing in your in your foundation i mean how is your foundation what are the foundations supporting child cancer so what are the initiatives that your foundation is taking uh over okay. to support yeah so so i mean uh, as uh, mentioned by nita different country in asia probably has a different problem so uh but um talking about um the major challenges uh, in uh, for example in our part uh, in Hong Kong is even Hong Kong is a relatively well developed uh, uh, I mean city but the problem the drug cost the escalating drug cost is still a big issue so if you talk about uh, the latest at once in uh, the children uh, in the treatment of child cancer like the target therapy the CAR T cell all this you are talking about like a sky high uh, I mean kind of prices so and how can we uh, lower down uh, the, this, uh, the drug costs and also the availability, as Lita mentioned. Uh, many of the patients, they don't even have money for the basic uh, kind of investigation uh, and treatment. So how to do with it? So in uh, Hong Kong, um, we have a certain kind of uh, evolution. So um, first, I think in order to achieve a good goal, uh, basically, you have to have a win-win-win situation. So what are this win-win-win situation? Uh, we can classify uh, the, the fee party. The first one is the pharmaceuticals. The second one is the, the, I mean, the patients and the parents. 
And the third part are the provider, including the government and the medical healthcare worker. So in order to make uh, the medical uh, treatments available, uh, including the diagnostic uh, things available, is the drug company should have a reasonable, I mean, uh, charging uh, in Asian country. So can they really lower down the cost to a um, relatively affordable uh, level? So then, then the, for the government, is how much money uh, are they willing to contribute to the child cancer? So we all believe our children are future. So, and then uh, if many, just like Little mentioned, leukemia is a very highly killable disease nowadays. So why should we abandon those children? So uh, we should talk to the government. And so um, just across the Shenzhen River in Hong Kong, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Garcia mentioned, uh, I also work in the Hong Kong Yusinjin Hospital, which is inside China. Uh, every Monday, I just go there. So I can see the evolution in China as well because they are a developed uh, uh, country. So what happened is uh, they started to reimburse. Uh, the, the, the citizens actually contribute to this uh, children catastrophic funding. And then the government will reimburse initially 60% and subsequently uh, a higher proportion, higher proportion. But one thing is uh, quite interesting is that initially they don't reimburse all the child cancer, but to those with a very highly curable one and a relatively affordable one. So with this initiative, I can see in 30 years, actually there's a drastic improvement in the survival, especially in those uh, 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 good, uh, those uh, cancer with good prognosis uh, like ALL um, and uh, a while ago uh, little mentioned about brain tumor why the diagnosis is low because they are all kept by adult neurosurgeon in China mm -hmm. I think in India probably that's the case and then their understanding is towards adult brain tumor because 85 percent of the adult brain tumor are high grade astrocytoma or glioma which is incurable so if your man mindset is like like this it's very bad for the patient. So I think the government has to have a recognize. So this one, the Onco Daily, is a very good platform uh, for the Asian uh, pediatric oncology to come together. And I mean, we, we can make some, produce some, uh, I mean, information material that uh, we can present to the different government. I have a and, question. Um, yes. this, is, this is curiosity. and. Um, is there any any uh, information available about the number of foundations in a, in, in your country dedicated to support uh, pediatric cancer research? Okay, so uh, in fact, we have a uh, 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 Hong Kong uh, Childhood Cancer Foundation, Children Cancer Foundation, uh, that was found in the eighties. From usually, these are from the uh, p uh, cancer patients' parents. So. They support uh, the treatments and also the research, as you mentioned. Okay, but well, we're talking about we're talking about one one foundation. Is that you said there is one foundation in Hong Kong dedicated to support yeah, yeah. cancer research? Yes, okay. one uh, specific uh, foundation, and there was a time, uh, but that one uh, gradually phased off, called the Childhood Catastrophic Fund, okay. also cater. So there, initially, there's some uh, 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 different foundation. And there's also, I think, in many Asian countries that we also have is the Ronald McDonald House. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even it's not actually for treatment, but they provide a sanitary environment for the poor patient uh, as a middle, a mid midway home. So as a little mention, a lot of time children after treatment may be immunocompromised. They may suffer from serious infection. So this kind of uh, Donald McDonald help can provide, uh, uh, I mean, some kind of a uh, sanitary site uh, for these patients as a midway home uh, yep. provide this stem cell time. Mm -hmm. I know very well the Ronald McDonald House because when, um, you know, my personal story is that my son was diagnosed um, of a high uh, risk metal blastoma brain cancer. And then we were living in Spain and then we had to move to the U.S. for um, better expertise to save his life. And then we stayed for 60 days. Yeah. We run a Madonna house uh, at Boston and they treat us, you know, like 
you know, the, it's like a home away from home resource, which is awesome. Yeah. I, I really love this organization. Just one question before we go, just I'd like to get from you, if it's possible, a uh, short statement, just like a uh, very short, I would say one minute for each of you. Um, what, what are, in your opinion, the key priorities and areas of focus for future research on pediatric cancer? I know it's a very wide um, question, but can you just uh, share kind of just uh, one idea that comes to your mind about? Okay, so if you only give me one minute, I, yeah. my personal belief is that in the future cancer treatment, maybe 100% you have to lean on immunotherapy because that's the basic. But many people understand immunotherapy, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, CAR T cell, but actually immunotherapy is a whole concept. So uh, you have monoclonal antibody, and even bone marrow transplant is uh, immunotherapy. So the cell therapy, uh, mostly immunotherapy. So how we cut costs, cut the cost for the immunotherapy of different type of immunotherapy will be our answer because Immunotherapy, like now leukemia, can we start with, uh, I mean, by specific antibody with low intensity chemo or even cellular therapy so we can minimize chemo? So, this is the direction that we have to go to. And then I think even in solid tumor, uh, immunotherapy will be the key. So, we should, uh, if in case we raise funding, we should raise funding to support immunotherapy. Okay. Nita, is that? Yeah, surprisingly, I agree with you. And uh, as in, um, so I think for um, childhood cancer treatment on the whole, we should all be working with the government um, closely because I think the maximum funding is finally going to come from the government with government support only. Government has the capability of any country has the capability to bring organizations together, bring people together, build networks, which will help. So that is some, an area where we should focus. Second, definitely a risk adapted treatment for every region and um, and in that risk adaptation i think immunotherapy plays a big role I, professor chan like with the way area the diseases where we are treating with targeted treatment it's become so much easier over the years to treat such children so get a, a relapsed childhood leukemia into remission with immunotherapy is so much easier than getting them with conventional treatment so if there is access to uh, these drugs um, for these patients at cost which they can afford, of course, that will be the way forward. And um, all the efforts should be directed towards collaborative research and building new mole as in discovering molecules and bringing these molecules to the reach of these uh, children. And uh, thank you. All right. Very, very, uh, uh, quick, uh, I mean, a follow up uh, statement with a uh, little because Just, there's something called the biosimilar. So we should, I mean, uh, make it faster. In the regulatory process, so and cheaper. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely that's definitely a good a good ending for the discussion. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining today. I remind the audience um, that we are um, doing this because we want to just uh, educate and share the truth about the child cancer, but also want to raise funds to support uh, an um, immediate trial. We want to open to to test a compound for different type of pediatric indications. So. Um, if you have the chance to support pediatric cancer search, today is the day. So donate and see you in the next session. Thank you so much.